we so often fail, fall short, I know all of us do, to praise God for the good things. We're quick to talk about the bad things, but um, I, and I'm not good at I'm sure you are as well, not always giving God the praise he deserves. So um, There's miracles all over this place this morning because um, miracles are normal when you follow Jesus, so he's good to us, isn't he? And so I'm thankful to, thankful to see you sitting there. Acts chapter number 15, verse number 1. If you're there, say, I got it. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dis- dispution with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phineas and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. When they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, It was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders came together for to consider the matter. And when they were there, much disputings, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how the good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, give the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, note this in your Bible, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. We'll call this this morning, Fight the Right Fight. Let's go to prayer. Father, thank you so much for your kindness to us. Thank you, Lord, for, as we've mentioned, for bringing Dar back to us. Father, we know that, as Paul said, whether here or there, to be absent from the body, to be present with you, but, Father, to be here is for your glory. And so, Father, we're thankful for extended life. We're thankful, Lord, for breaths. Every breath we receive, we know, crosses across your desk for approval. So thank you, God, that our times are in your hands. And I pray, Lord, for continued healing, continued health. And I pray, Lord, for a healthy 2024 for him. I thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, Father, as it goes out, that it will do what it always does and not return void, not because I've said it, but because your spirit has. So guide us, I pray. Help us to fight the right fight today. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. You can find a fight pretty easy. You don't have to look very far. You can just wake up and scroll your phone, and you can find something to argue about, usually. I think maybe, you know, as, I, as you know, I work at a children's behavioral health center. I'm amazed at how connected they are. And the connection isn't always a good thing because there's always something, if you will, to be, to be arguing about. You can argue about politics. You can argue, argue about religion. You can argue about pretty much anything you want. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, you can wake up, you can scroll your phone, unlock that thing, and it's go time. If you want to have a fight, you can. And a lot of times when you look at it, you watch it, and I'll watch it sometimes. I'll watch comments or things from people, and I'll think, you know, that's not going to end well. You know, you'll watch and you think, ah, you shouldn't have said that. You're good at seeing that at other people, aren't you? But when it comes to your life, sometimes you're like, I don't see that at all. But there are things that are right fights and good fights, and there are things that really aren't worth fighting about. Uh, when I became a pastor, a pastor friend of mine told me the advice he would give me. He said, don't go looking for a fight. One will find you eventually. And I found that to be true. You really don't have to go looking for one anymore. Actually, one will find you. What is it that we are supposed to be fighting about? What is it are we supposed to be standing for and standing against? Well, at the end of Acts 14, we know Paul and Barnabas returned from the mission field and God had done amazing things with the Gentiles. They faced trial and hardship, and, but God has used it for his good. Now, what happens when it comes to Acts chapter number 15, there's the battle of believers, basically. And the church's leaders fight over what it takes to become a Christian. Do you have to be like me to be a Christian? Do you have to become Jewish to be saved? And so there's a group of believers, there's a group of Pharisees that would say, I'm willing to fight for that. You have to be circumcised and you have to obey the law of Moses if you're actually going to be a true Christian. 
And if you think of it as a boxing match, in the early church, we're going to have two corners that we're going to see this morning. And in one corner, we're going to have believing Pharisees. And their belief is they're going to get in the ring to say this. To be a Christian, you have to become Jewish and obey the law. To be a Christian, you have to obey the law and be Jewish, basically. And it says in verse number 1, it says, And said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now note that in your Bible, you cannot be saved. There are a group of Jews who say that to be a Christian, you have to become Jewish. You have to get circumcised. So starting with Abraham, it was God marked the Israel Israelites as his people and gave them a sense of cultural and ethnic identity. They were saying that unless you did this, yeah, it's cool that you believe Jesus. It's great that you put your trust in him. But wait, that's not all, as some TV promoter might do. You also have to actually become like we are. So there's got to be an outside thing that happens as well. And not only do you have to follow this, this Christ, you also have to follow these, we well, have to follow these rules. And so in this corner we have believing Pharisees. In the other corner we have Paul and Pete. And we also will have Barnabas step in. And they say cultural identity and law keeping won't save you. We're actually saved by grace. By grace through faith are you saved. So what we have here is the cultural identity law keeping won't save you. We're saved by grace. Paul and Pete don't think you have to become Jewish to be saved. They argue that we're saved entirely by grace. Not cultural, not ethnic identity. No other thing can save us. We're saved by grace, not by works. So in one corner we have saying Jesus basically isn't enough. It's nice you have him, but you also need this. And in another corner we have saying actually grace, not works, is actually what saves us. So the match goes about three rounds we'll see as they go back and forth. Because in verse number one, remember they say now, you cannot be saved unless you become like us. And the first round is this. Number one, we have false doctrine. Certain men, probably the same men who came from James, that Paul mentions in Galatians chapter number two. And they're saying in round number one, you have to become cultural Jewish and obey the law to be saved. And I don't know about you, but I'm like the old country song says, I fought the law and the law won. I always lose to the law. The Ten Commandments, the 613 other laws and the things in the scriptures we find. And the Bible says if you've broken one, you've broken them all. So if we were to stand against the law, none of us could stand. So here's what happened. The Christians who are Pharisees, the pro-circumcision parties, what Paul calls them in Galatians, they, they, their delegation for the southern Jerusalem go up 300 miles to Antioch. Now Antioch's an amazing place where Paul and Barnabas preached for about a year where the Gentiles, non-Jews are coming to faith. They're the first church to send out missionaries. Paul and Barnabas and seem like they're willing to try new things to preach the gospel. So they're the young, cool church at this time. At this time, but the delegation of Pharisees, they don't like what they're seeing. People are becoming Jewish or obeying people aren't becoming Jewish or obeying their law. They're actually coming to Christ and they feel like that's enough. We can actually read about what these Pharisees taught in Antioch and Galatians. We know what Paul's talking about. He says, because of false brethren brought in who came in secretly to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ, that, we might be, that they might bring us into bondage. So Paul takes their arguments seriously. He calls them false brothers. He said he wouldn't yield even for a moment. Paul describes those who are pro-circumcision, pro-law, pro-Jewish, their identity, Pharisees convince Peter to not even spend time with the non-Jews anymore. So we see this, watch what Paul, we call, now watch this, who came in secretly to take away our liberty, basically, which we have in Christ. So the people were saying, oh, 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 you're a Christian now. Oh, you better not eat that. You're a Christian now. You better not sit there. You're a Christian now. You better not wear that. You're a Christian now. You better not. And Paul says, wait, 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 wait. You're actually taking away their liberty. And Paul says, I'm going in the ring. Because what he says is what he shows is actually Paul had been in the ring before and he actually got in the ring with Peter. In Galatians 2 it says, but when Peter came to Antioch, Paul said, I withstood him to the face. I got in Peter's face and I said, because he was to be blamed for before the certain Jews came from James, he did eat with Gentiles. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, as long as Pete was with us, he was fine. 
But when these religious people came in who said you have to live a certain way, Pete all of a sudden became a chameleon and became like whatever table he was sitting at. And you've probably seen people do that. You've all been to high school, right? You change based on whoever's sitting across the table from you. And Pete said, I, and Paul said, I got in Pete's face and said, what are you doing? Because you believed before that all you need to do is trust in Christ. And now, because these people have come along, now something had changed. Now, why, when we think about this, why would Peter do that? Didn't God give him a supernatural vision of clean and unclean animals come down from heaven and God tell him to eat all of them? Didn't Peter see the non-Jewish centurion Cornelius and his family get filled with the Holy Spirit? Of course he did. Maybe it was because the circumcision party convinced him that his eating with non-Jews was a stumbling block for Jews coming to faith in Jerusalem. Regardless of why, we don't know why, but we do know that this is a gospel issue. And gospel issues are always right to fight about and fight for. Paul and Barnabas head to Jerusalem to argue their case at the Jerusalem council. So what we see going on here is Pharisee math. And Pharisee math is Jesus plus cultural identity plus law keeping equals salvation. And if you add to the gospel, hear me, you take away from the gospel. If anything can be added to Jesus, then you minus Jesus. It is faith alone in Christ alone that saves a person. Faith alone in Christ alone is what saves a person. So what we have here is the, the Pharisees saying, Jesus, that's good, plus being like us, plus keeping the law, that's how you're saved. And who of us could stand if that was the truth? So there's gatekeeping that's going on. And the gatekeeping that's going on is when someone takes it upon themselves to decide who does or does not have access to rights to a community or an identity. And we see gatekeeping all the time. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 said, instead of gatekeeping, open the gate wide open. When Jesus said, come, basically come, whoever will, let him come. So when we think about Christianity, I know we'll look at these guys and say, well, I can't believe they made a bunch of rules and let, wouldn't let people in. Well, we've got to be careful because is gatekeeping a thing in Christianity today? Because what are the cultural and identity markers that we say? If you're this way, then you're a real Christian. How might we be building a new type of law for non-believers to follow in order to come to Jesus? It's easy for us to make well-intentioned gates that people come, from, come to faith in Christ. So when we think about this, how are the gates we unintentionally build? What are the kind of gates that we could accidentally unintentionally build? Well, in Christianity, you'll see people build gates, whether it be you've got to dress like us. You've got to dress a certain way. Or you've got to listen to the same kind of music as we listen to. You have to worship, and we worship. You have to worship loud with your hands up. Or you've got to worship quietly. Keep your hands down. I've been in churches before. We had, I knew one church that had the clappers on one side and the non-clappers on the other. It looked like the State of the Union the president would give when someone would sing. The clappers would clap, and the other non-clappers would be like this. It was really hilarious to watch. So there were clappers and non-clappers. And so how about we would, intentionally, we would never intentionally exclude anyone, but we're not intentionally about addressing our gates. We're going to end up excluding more than we realize. How about voting like us? There are people that believe you have to, be, you have to vote a certain way. If you don't, you can't be a Christian. There's no way. There are other people who believe the reverse. No, it's not you vote this way. You have to vote this way. And there's no way you can be a Christian if you don't. If you don't what? That's gatekeeping. Listen, and this is the only political thing you'll ever hear me say. Jesus isn't a Republican or a Democrat. He's on his own side. Remember the Bible in the book of, in the book of Joshua? They're like, whose side are you on? Neither is what he says. It's not that, that, that God should be on America's side. It's that America should join God's side, right? So I move on from that to say we can, if not careful, hold people even to, whoa, 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 how are you living in this way? And if you're not, then you must not be a Christian. Well, what you should vote is Bible principles. And whatever party lines up with that, that's how we're supposed to vote. But be careful that we don't hold people's salvation based upon how they would dress 
what they would wear, what music they would listen to, if they worship loud or worship quiet or speak the same language we do. And you can even gatekeep yourself if you're not careful. I know it's about believing in Jesus, but also I have to be a good person, and if I'm not a good person, I feel bad. That's Jesus plus works equals salvation. How many of us, how many of the ways we think we need to be better are rooted in cultural identity? If I would just read my Bible more, I'd be a better Christian. Yeah, you probably would. But what about the days you miss it? The enemy can keep that against you and hold that against you. There's many times that we would look and see that gatekeeping comes in. And I'm from the independent, fundamental, missionary Baptist crowd, whom I love. I have several friends there. I was saved in that denomination. My kids were saved in that denomination. I don't know why I can't say denomination. But I was saved in that. I have friends in that. I preached all over the place, in states all over the place, in that circle. And as I say, I'm thankful for it because I got enough gospel to be saved. My kids received the gospel, the true gospel, and they were saved. But I heard preaching from everything against genes to screens. I mean, they preached against everything. So much so that you could go into church and know what they were against, but never know what they were for. You know what I mean? You had no idea what they were for, but you knew what they were against. And it's kind of ironic now. God has a sense of humor. Now I've got three screens and a bunch of people in jeans. But anyway, it's like I have no problem with screens or jeans. Why? Because screens or jeans is not a gospel, it's not a gospel compromise. It's culture. And so when you think of what we're talking about here, there are many times that we would actually preach against something. I heard people would I heard people stand up in church and say, I'm thankful we don't have those things on the wall. And I'm thinking, but we have them in our lap. Most of us have them in our pocket. And you think, well, if you sing a new song, we sing new songs sometimes, and people will say, well, that's going contemporary. I think online giving might be contemporary, don't you? There's things in culture that just advance, you know what I mean? It's like things change in the culture, but hear me, salvation doesn't. And where salvation rests and where salvation lies does not change. So while we would look at it and say, wait, I might not be that much different than these Pharisees back in the past who said, well, I know you came to Christ, but what's that up on your wall in your church? I know you came to Christ, but is that jeans I see? See what I'm saying? If not careful, we can actually add to a gospel that the Bible actually never adds anything to other than Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You can't add to it. And you can't take away from it. And Pharisee Mass says Jesus plus cultural identity plus law keeping equals salvation. And hear me, as you become a Christian, when you become a Christian, God will save you and then he'll clean you up. Of course, some things will change in your life and there is sanctification that takes place. But they don't need our standards. They need our Savior. And many times we try to give people our standard and say, hey, before you come to Christ, you've got to be living this way. And do I wasn't doing that. I was held bound with a hammer down. And Jesus Christ came in. And that does change the way you look. That does change the way you dress. It does change the place you go. It'll change the way you vote. It'll change all kinds of things about you. But you won't even be recognizable to your friends and family. That's a good thing. But to come to Christ, you need nothing but bring yourself and all your sin and lay them at his cross and trust him. That's what you need. But there'll be churches, and it's not here for sure, who'll say, well, they also need. And I'm not willing to fight those fights, right? Because what I want to see, I want to see people come to Christ. And then from there, well, Pharisee math gets involved, we'll get in trouble. And there's furious debate that takes place in verse number 2. Paul and Barnabas lock horns with false teaching. That's what it says in verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So they're sending Paul and Barnabas up to talk about this. And then we have a fair decision, verse number 2b. Certain of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So we have the first ever board member of the church, the first ever board meeting. So we see that this round goes, we're not saved. Well, this round goes, the first round, round two formal discussion is when Pete speaks. That's what we have. So we're not saved by this. We're not saved by... Cultural identity by works, but by God's grace is what Paul is actually going to say. 
And we see that as certain rose up in the sect of the Pharisees which believed that it was needful to circumcise them and the law of Moses, verse 5. Now watch. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. So we are not say, and when there have been much disputing, Peter rose up. Now Pete's going to speak because you know this Pete always speaks. That's what he does. And said unto them, men and brethren, ye know that a good while ago made, made choice among us, the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So what's Pete saying? Peter's actually saying, hey, remember all those times, that time ago when God showed me this dream? This was months ago when we talked about it here. Peter was, had the dream and God said, don't you call unclean what I call clean? Remember that? And Peter's going through and he's talking about that. And he said, and put no difference between us and them. And then Peter drops a bomb on them and says, verse number Verse number nine, 10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon us, upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What's that? The law had become a heavy burden. 613 commandments were more than anyone could bear. And what Peter says to the people who are believing that you have to be a certain way to be saved, Peter says, wait, 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 wait a minute. You're putting on them a weight that was actually crushing you. And if we're not careful, we will put standards on people that we're not even living up to. You know what I mean? If you're not careful, we'll put standards and requirements on people, and that's what Pete is saying. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, verse 10, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Pete says, why would we put something on them that was crushing us? Isn't the grace of God great? Jesus responded to this, actually we find this when Jesus said this, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and you shall find rest for your souls. So his response to that we see Peter saying, hey, why would we put weights on them? Why would we say, well, you're, if you're, I know you're a Christian, but are you going to obey the law? Because you've got to obey the law. And Paul steps up and says, no, 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 they don't have to obey the law. Here's what they have to do. They have to trust Christ. They have to follow him. And Peter's saying, wait, we're putting laws on them that we actually were crushed by ourselves. And Jesus says, come unto me. And every time I read this verse, at work a couple of years ago, there was a homeless guy I was talking to. And his life was busted up. He came in and he was in our waiting area and they asked me to go in and talk to him. And I went in and talked to him and he was telling me all about his story. And I mean, it was a mess what he had been through. And so I don't do this all the time, but I, I had a, there was a Bible there and I said, hey, would you, would you read it? Would you read a verse for me? Because he talked a little bit about having a church background and, um, I said, would you, would you read a verse for me? And he said, yeah. So I took him to Matthew 11. And I said, um, I, I want you to read this verse. And I do that a lot of times, especially in biblical counseling. It's, you, you want them to read the verse, and you want the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to connect, and you can sometimes watch lights go off when that happens. So I've handed the Bible to a lot of people across a lot of desks and said, hey, read this verse. And here's what they do. They do what we do when we read a verse. We read it as if we're passing a road sign. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take me with me, you shall find rest for your souls. And that's exactly how he read it the first time. And I said, can, can we slow that down? I said, and as a matter of fact, as you're reading it, can I stop you at certain points? He's like, sure, I don't, I don't care. So I said, okay, go. He said, come unto me. I said, stop. I said, okay, who, who's me? He said, that's Jesus, right? I said, that's Jesus, yes. Okay, go again. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I said, stop. He said, what? I said, come unto me. I said, who's, who's me? He said, Jesus. I said, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I said, who's that? He said, all. I said, who's all? He said, everybody. I said, everybody, I said, is that me? He said, yeah. I said, is that you? He said, yeah. I said, okay, let's go back. He said, I said, start again. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
I said, stop. I said, come unto me, Jesus, all ye that labor, that's you and me, and are heavy laden, I'll give you what? And church, I'm not exaggerating. I've handed the Bible to a lot of people and slid it across the desk to everyone from homeless people to politicians. And I'm telling you, I've never seen in my life up until that point or from since that point the word of God arrest the heart like it did that day. And I said, start over and read it again. And he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And he said, I will give you rest. When this guy said rest, tears started rolling down his face. And he looked up at me and he said, do you know how long it's been? since I've had rest. He said, rest? He'll give me rest? And he's like, he, he can't believe. I'm, you would have thought I was handing him a million dollars. He'll give me rest? I said, it's not just rest for now. I said, look at the verse. Take my yoke upon you. You shall find rest for your souls. You shall find rest for your souls. Hey, come unto me, all you labor and heavy I will give you rest. Rest, take my yoke upon you. And that homeless man in that waiting room for the first time in his life realized what's my responsibility to come to Jesus. Where does rest rest? Rest, rest in Christ and Christ alone. At that point, I couldn't take that homeless man, and I don't mean to make light of the situation and say, okay, well, yeah, he'll give you rest if you join a Southern Baptist church. If you become independent, fundamental missionary, no, he will give you rest. And sometimes if we're not careful, we'll rob people of rest, won't we? Rest is found in Christ. I can't take away someone's rest. I can't give someone rest. Jesus and Jesus alone gives someone rest. So we've got to be careful to say we're taking away people's rest in Christ. So we're saying you've got to add. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They wasn't fair, you see, because they were taking away people's rest. So Jesus said, come unto me. And just like that homeless man that day, just like me when I was 15, just like you, whatever your age was, when you came, you came to Christ, and Christ alone will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Why would Jesus say that? Because the yoke of the law was crushing people. That's why Paul's saying and Pete's saying, why would we bring the, the yoke of the law back on people who have found liberty and rest in Christ? You are free this morning in Christ. That's what Paul says throughout Galatians. Be, be joyful because you're free. And that's what Paul and Peter are saying. So the, come unto me, we see that. So round three is God always planned to save the Gentiles by faith and faith alone in Christ. And that's what we see in verses 12 to 21. We know that James, the crowd hears Peter, they go silent. James, the brother of Jesus, the church, and church leader stands up in verse number 15, he begins to speak and agree with the words of the prophets as it's written. After this, verse 16, I'll return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. We'll build against the ruins thereof. I will set it up. So he, what he's saying is, is that God always had this plan. God always had the plan to do this, is what James is saying. Known unto God all the works in the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is, watch this, that we trouble not them from which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. James is saying, why are we going to trouble baby believers with all this law? Why are we going to do that? Listen, the Holy Spirit can clean a person up. Can he? The Holy Spirit has the power to do that. And I know sometimes we want to do it. I know sometimes we want to be quick to say, okay, you're saved. When I was a youth pastor, I went to a house, a, a, a six-year-old had been saved. A six-year-old boy got saved. So we went to the house to talk to the family about being baptized. And I'm telling you, the mom said to us, well, he still acts kind of wild. I know you said he got saved, but he's still running around, jumping all over the place. I said, he's six. Of course he's diving off of things, right? It's like, well, but he's not reading the Old Testament scriptures every night. Like, he's not going to. And the truth is, most Christians I preach to probably aren't either. But a six-year-old, what, what, what's James saying? He's like, don't trouble them. 
The world has enough fights for them to fight. Let them rest in Christ. That's why when you come here, I hope you rest in Christ at least for an hour. You're sitting here thinking, i got rest here. I don't have to put on the weight of the world that's going to happen as soon as I leave this parking lot. It's going to get weighty again, but here, I don't want to trouble you. Wherefore, my sins, that we trouble not them, which from the Gentiles are turned to God. A six-year-old, whether he's saved or not saved, will act just like a six-year-old, right? And shout out to my teens here, so will a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old. We have to put an imaginary crown over their head and help them grow into it. But saved kids are still kids. We can't expect them to live our spiritual life. They don't have the miles that we have on them. We can't expect a young person to live our Christianity. They have their own culture they're in. They're trying to figure all that out. But the picture of this is we got to make sure we don't put burdens on them that's going to make them feel like they have to live a certain way because then what you create is a bunch of people. All you create when it comes to living by the law are Pharisees, meaning pride, or failures, meaning they can't do it. The only thing the law produces is Pharisees and failures. That's all it can produce. One will be people saying, look what I've done, and other people not coming to church saying, look what I've done. And Jesus says, come. I will give you rest. Amen? And the verdict? The verdict is, watch what he says and James says this, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them from among the Gentiles or turn to God, but that we write unto them, so James says, we'll write them a letter, that they abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses all the time had told them the cities that they preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Respect Jewish customs, but know they won't save you. It's a cultural compromise, not a gospel compromise. What James is saying is we should at times limit our liberty out of love for others. Sometimes we have to limit our liberty out of love for others. Sometimes what James is saying, here's what, because there will be a culture of people coming up that says, see, I can live however I want. That's not what Acts 15 says. That's why they sent a letter. As a matter of fact, because they could easily send a letter and said, you are free in Christ, live how you want. That's not what James said. James said, we write a letter that they abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. What's he saying? You are different now. There's a change in your life. It's not that God just wants you so bad and he just wants a friend so much that he doesn't care how you live. Listen, even the backdrop of this message, it matters how we live. It always has mattered how we live. We will give an account for how we live. So the, when, when we see this, the verdict is salvation and this thing of the gospel is a, is a fight we have to fight. It's the right fight. We will always fight for the gospel. In this church, by God's grace, we will always stand on what this book says. The gospel we will not compromise on. There are compromises that take place culturally. The churches that wouldn't have screens and wouldn't have online services, all of a sudden COVID happens, and guess what they're doing this morning? They're all projecting the message, their message out over online, over Facebook and YouTube. And that has turned out to be a very good thing because preachers are preaching to people that would never heard the gospel before. But had COVID not happened, I don't know there would be churches saying, we're not going online, bless God, people need to come to church. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Don't they need to hear the message? Don't they need to hear the gospel? So yes, there is cultural compromise, and that's what's happened in Acts 15. There's a cultural compromise to say, listen, you, can, you should at times limit your liberty in Christ because you're going to offend a brother or sister. Yes, you have liberty. That's why Paul said to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. It wasn't that Paul was a chameleon where he just became whatever he's around, but he said, listen, if eating this would bother you, then I won't eat this because I love you, and that's why. It's something to look at and say, well, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that like you believe that, but 
we believe Jesus. And that's why Paul said, whether they preach Christ, I'm pleased if they preach Christ. That's why. And here's the truth. In the middle of all this boxing match, who wins? And we're done. The winner? Grace. Grace wins every time, as the song says. Grace is what wins. For Moses in old time hath in every city to preach them, being read in the synagogues have they. Then it pleased the apostles, verse 22, and elders with the whole church to send the chosen men of their own company, Paul and Barnabas, Jewish name and Silas, chief of men among the brethren. And there were letters by them after the smear of the apostles, letters of the brethren, sent greetings to the brethren, which the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicily. We see that. What one? Grace did. And that's what won in my life. And that's what won in your life. And by God's grace, that's what will win in this church's life. Yes, we do have times where we're going to have to ask ourselves the question, is this a cultural compromise or is this a gospel compromise? And hear me, we will never compromise gospel. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, the soon coming king, the virgin birth, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the scriptures are our final and ultimate authority that Jesus is coming again. We know all these things by grace, through faith alone, Christ alone, faith alone, salvation alone. We will not compromise on them. But we got to be careful not to fight about things ultimately that really don't matter. Amen? They don't. They just don't. And we don't here, which is why I love this. We just, we really don't at all that I've seen. We've got to be careful to swing the gate, swing the open the door wide open. Because what you don't want in a church for the front door to get so small that nobody feels like they can enter. We want it to be wide open. Whosoever will, let him come. So what you wear, and what you listen to, and who you vote for, and all these things you face on a daily basis and election season, all those things. Run to your Bible to see how to live. And when you do that, understand that these are all issues stacked up on top of your salvation. And your salvation does not rest on you. Never has and never will. And you should praise God for that. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you so much for your attention. The real winner in all of this is grace. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Why, lest any man should boast, he says. The law only creates Pharisees and failures. I want to remind you this morning, dear Christian, that your security is not in the fact that you did well this week. And your salvation is not vanished because you blew it this week. It's Christ and Christ alone. You are saved by his power. And there should be, don't allow the enemy to give you a guilt trip for falling short. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus knew exactly who he was getting when he got you and he got me. And it didn't stop him at all from going to the cross for you. So I want to encourage you this morning to know that your salvation is secure in him. Don't let the enemy put on you laws that you just can't carry. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for grace. It truly is amazing that you have forgiven us, that you have saved us. And I pray this morning for those of us, God, who may not put up gates for other people. We actually put up gates for ourselves and standards that we just can't live up to. Father, I pray that we'd be guided by your word, that we'd be people of your book, that we would live out biblically how you would have us to. When we fall short, Lord, and we will, this week we will, this day we will, remind us that grace wins. Remind us that we are saved by that, through that, by faith alone. I pray for every family, for every heart here. I pray, Lord, you bring encouragement Throughout this week, Father, we're in a culture, Lord, certainly. There's compromise all around us. But help us to fight the right fight. Help us to fight that Christ and Christ alone is what saves a person. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.